1 Thessalonians 5, The Day of the Lord But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light, and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep, as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that, whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore comfort yourselves together, and edify one another, even as also ye do. Some hold up this passage as supportive of a coming pre-tribulation rapture, postulating that it makes a distinction between unbelievers who will be subjected to destruction at the return of Christ, and believers who will be spared, and this can only mean that believers will be taken out of the world before the great tribulation begins. In particular, verse 5-3 is cited for its application of the word they to identify those who shall not escape as being evidence, based on reasoning akin to alternation or process of elimination, that all others, i.e. the unspoken we, meaning believers, will conversely, necessarily escape. Moreover, that this escape will occur prior to the period of tribulation. Similarly, verse 5-4 is asserted by some advocates of the pre-tribulation rapture view as demonstrating that, because it says that the day of the Lord will not overtake believers as a thief in the night, this must mean that believers will not be present to witness the destruction that befalls others. The most frequently quoted verse from within this passage might be that which is arguably most directly supportive of the pre-tribulation rapture view. The assurance given in verse 5-9 that God has not appointed, in the Greek, etheto, established or destined, believers to be subjected to wrath, but rather to obtain salvation through Jesus Christ. Now, it warrants acknowledgment that all of the above points of argument for a pre-tribulation rapture based on the text of 1 Thessalonians 5 are predicated on the idea that the manifestations of destruction and wrath mentioned in the passage are references to the time of tribulation, which believers will be able to avoid. It is equally pertinent to recognize that verses 5-2 to 5-3 are quite clear on the point that the day of the Lord is when the destruction will come. Therefore, holding this pre-tribulation rapture view logically requires also holding one or the other of the following positions. 1. That the day of the Lord will be when both the gathering up of believers and the destruction of unbelievers will occur, in this sequence, which is an untenable position as it logically sabotages itself by denying either the period of tribulation or the very notion of rapture before it. 2. That the gathering up of believers will occur before the day of the Lord when the destruction of unbelievers will occur, which, for the above reason, is the only logically tenable position of the two. Let us now examine the above arguments in the light of other areas of Scripture as well as logic, and see how they actually fare. What does seem clear from the passage is that Christ's return will be an event that many will never have even expected, much less have been able to predict the exact moment of, like a thief in the night, and that those who will say that a situation of peace and safety has finally been attained in the world will, just as soon, find themselves sorely mistaken as their destruction ensues. Moreover, those who will be lulled into that false sense of security, whoever they may be, being entangled in personal or material attachments, preoccupations, and priorities, as travail upon a woman with child, will be unable to escape the destruction. The followers of Jesus Christ are reminded that they are enlightened by the word of God, so that they should not be caught unawares when Christ does return. This is cautionary advice, given for a reason that is elucidated further. Believers are then admonished to remain lucid and vigilant in keeping watch for the return of the Savior, 
the signs of which are elsewhere revealed in scripture and until that day of redemption comes to maintain their faith love and hope of salvation the likening of these three attributes to spiritual armor which should be worn until the day of the lord has an implication that should not be ignored the presence of a persistent threat armor is for protection against the assault of an adversary why would the king of peace ever command his subjects to don their armor unless he were anticipating an enemy attack verse five three simply tells us that they who will feel sure that all is finally well with the world will be shocked to see the coming of jesus and will suffer sudden destruction verse five four merely reminds us that christ's advent should come as no surprise to us when it occurs the above interpretation of verse 5 9 is founded squarely on the presumption that wrath refers to the great tribulation and that believers will not need to endure it however an examination of the sequential details of the end time events given in the ultimate prophecy surrounding the return of christ in the book of revelation yields a different conclusion in revelation the first mention of the term wrath greek or geese is at the moment when unbelievers as they seek safety hiding in caves and among the rocks beg the mountains and stones to fall and conceal them from the one on the throne and the wrath of the lamb as the day of his wrath is come revelation six sixteen to seventeen this episode of mass panic among unbelievers when they are finally forced to acknowledge that the wrath of god is real and imminent does not occur until just after christ has opened the sixth of the seven seals revelation six twelve by which time the events symbolized by the four horsemen including conquering arguably by the antichrist on the white horse war famine and death as well as the martyrdom of innumerable believers will have already transpired and just before the remaining servants of god are sealed to endow them with immunity from the coming onslaught of the four angels against the earth and sea revelation seven one to eight the next mention of wrath in revelation is found in the worshipful praise of god by the twenty-four elders in response to the angels blowing of the seventh trumpet wherein they proclaim and thy wrath is come and the time of the dead that they should be judged and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants the prophets and to the saints and them that fear thy name small and great and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth revelation eleven eighteen the subsequent occurrences of wrath and the statements encompassing them throughout the rest of revelation leave no doubt that it refers specifically to the final and unbridled expression of the fury of god which will be visited upon the wicked verses fourteen eight fourteen ten fourteen nineteen eighteen three and nineteen fifteen and that this punishment will be executed by seven angels beginning with the seventh and final trumpet blast through the outpouring of seven symbolic golden vials or bowls containing the seven last plagues verses fifteen one fifteen seven and sixteen one as it is written in them is filled up the wrath of god provided that this definition of wrath which is made so abundantly clear in revelation is understood the sequence of the events of the opening of the sixth seal the safeguarding of the remaining body of believers by their being marked with the seal of god and the seventh and final trump which will herald the commencement of the execution of the wrath of god in conjunction with christ's second coming and gathering of the faithful is entirely in agreement with the assurance in first thessalonians five nine for god hath not appointed us to wrath though there is a tendency for many to include in wrath the earthly calamities and the atrocities committed by the antichrist prior to the day of the lord these events comprise not wrath but rather tribulation let us dismiss any popular connotations attached to the meaning of the word and comprehend only its pure meaning it is easy to forget that the word tribulation means trial or test in our modern parlance in the original greek flipsios found in revelation seven fourteen for example according to strong's concordance term number two three four seven can be translated as persecution affliction or distress as well as tribulation it is crucial to understand that neither has it been the reality throughout history nor is it the scenario prophesied in revelation that the ungodly are the persecuted population indeed it will be quite the opposite as the ungodly will be those who afflict the godly 
and only the faithful will have any faith to be tested. That the second coming of Jesus Christ to gather his faithful and the outpouring of the wrath of God on the unfaithful will be at least relatively simultaneous, and that these events will certainly occur after the tribulation period, is in concordance with numerous other verses in Scripture. In their descriptions of the circumstances of the return of Jesus Christ, all of the following verses employ some combination of mutually overlapping figures of speech, details, aspects, and or definitive references to the time of their occurrence within the prophetic time frame of Revelation, which, taken all together, give the distinct impression that these verses all depict the same phenomenon from various angles. 1 Corinthians 15.51-52 Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In an instant, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound. The dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Revelation 10.7 But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. Matthew twenty four twenty nine to 31 Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. 1 Thessalonians 4.15-17 By the word of the Lord, we declare to you that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will be the first to rise. After that, we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Second Thessalonians 2, 1-3 Now we beseech you, brethren, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. John 6.39 And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day.